Okay, the next section is called monogamy or polygamy, question mark. Um, just before we start, let's, um, I'll just say, give me a thumbs up. If you're listening, give me a thumbs up. Let me know that you're there and that you're appreciating um, what I'm doing. So let's crack on. The early world of Homo sapiens remains only marginally less obscure than that of his predecessors. For until the appearance of written records in about 3000 BC, most of what is known is based on an amalgamation of limited archaeological facts with a projection back from the thought patterns of primitive peoples who have survived into modern times. Archaeological facts are all too often subject to a number of interpretations and primitive tribes like, tribes like statistics can be used to prove almost anything. For at least the first 150,000 years of Homo sapiens' existence, the only footholds in the shifting sands of academic speculation are those based on tools, bones and the accumulated debris of man's living quarters. About his personal life, virtually all that is known is that he had evolved some kind of religious or humanitarian beliefs that led him to care for the sick and aged and to bury their dead. Their sex life remains a mystery. But all history is a sequence. Everything that happens is in some way related to what has gone before. So the sex and family life of early Homo sapiens like that of Homo sapiens today, was a product, however remotely, of sex and family life 500,000, 5 million, 15 million years ago. This is why it is both interesting and instructive to look at the problem of which of the apes man, man's ancestors most closely resembled, even if there is no firm answer. For some of the emotive questions that exercise people's minds today, about whether early society was dominated by the man or woman, whether descent was traced through the father's or the mother's line, and whether fertility goddesses or male chauvinist gods were more deeply venerated, might arguably be answered if it were known whether Homo habilis most closely resembled the monogamous gibbon, in which case the makings of patriarchy existed from the start, or the promiscuous chimpanzee, when only matriarchy would be possible. At some point in man's pre-human human state, he found his tongue. Hunting and tool-making were social skills that made it imperative for him to communicate on a more complex level than the primates. Even the gibbon, one of the most voluble of the apes, still has only a very limited number of sounds and sound sequences. Each of them, however, does have a specific meaning and one of them has particular relevance to the early human, human condition. The message it conveys is, stay away from my wife, quote. And there is a note there, seven, which I will come back to at the end and let you know who, uh, who that's from. Of the apes, only the gibbon would need to use such an expression, for only the gibbon has a wife. Other non-human primates live in mixed sex groups, in which one sex, sex often predominates and when there is no pair bonding. The female chimpanzee, for example, I don't know why I keep wanting to say chimpanzee, it's chimpanzee. The female chimpanzee, for example, mates with several males in swift succession and has no particular ties with, with any of them. The gibbon's monogamous habit is usually attributed to the fact that the female, like the human female, but, unlong, but unlike other primates, is not subject to an estrus cycle, the reproductive cycle that ensures sexual re receptivity only during the day or two of maximum fertility as ovulation. The theory is, is that since the gibbon is receptive all the time, the male can satisfy his sexual urge as often as he chooses with only one partner, and one partner is there, therefore all he needs. It might be truer to suppose that one partner is all he wants. Monogamy must be restful in comparison with the situation of the chimpanzee, the gorilla and the baboon. Perpetually on call to satisfy the demands of every female in the troop who happens to be in heat. 
It was Ernest Haeckel, H-A-E-C-K-E-L. Ernest Haeckel, scientific popularizer and contemporary of Darwin, who first publicised the idea that the gibbon was man's closest relative, and it was an idea that appealed to Western historians. It made early human development relatively easy to reconstruct, as the gibbon's family life bears a convenient resemblance to that of modern Western man. Husband, wife and children live together as a group, and when the children grow up, they leave home, or or are thrown out, and set up on their own. If this was how humanity started off and how it has it has ended up, then the millennia between can be filled in comprehensively, even sympathetically, with a homely picture of a daily round in which the man goes hunting, the woman keeps home or cave, and there is an occasional break in the form of a get-together with neighbours over the hill. Unfortunately for this comfortable reconstruction, polygamy has been far more widespread than monogamy during most of the 5,000 years of recorded history. The promiscuous chimpanzee appears at first sight to be a more recalcitrant candidate for the role of humanity's closest relative, but chromosome counts and blood protein studies are only part of a substantial body of recent research that comes down strongly in his favour. The chimpanzee's intelligence is a major factor. Whereas the gibbon is intellectually the least well endowed of all the apes today, the chimpanzee, after evolving along his own branch of the family tree for the last 14 million years or so, is able to use simple tools, sponges of crumpled leaves to soak up water from crevices, stalks to pry ants from their nests, sticks as levers and to defend himself by throwing branches rocks and other missiles at marauders he has learned to catch kill and eat young antelopes and monkeys to stand and occasionally walk upright and to communicate extensively though still by means of gestures and grunts the chimpanzee today in fact behaves very much as man's in behaves very much as man's ancestor, Ramapithecus, must have behaved when he first set out on the road that was to lead to the evolution of the human race. Note 8. If in the very early days humanity bore a strong family resemblance to the chimpanzee, at least one major biological change must subsequently have taken place though there is no way of knowing when it began or when it was completed. The human female's menstrual cycle must gradually have replaced the estrus cycle of the primates, a modification with long-term results in the case of the female's own sexuality and long-term repercussions on the relationship between men and women. But whether such changeover would necessarily bring about a general preference for monogamy is a matter for debate, Though anthropologists equate monogamy with lack of an estrus cycle, an opinion that appears to be based more on hindsight than historical data, geneticists take a different view. Darwin said that the central struggle of life was the struggle to survive and reproduce, and his spiritual heirs, the sociobiologists of today, claim that the participants in this struggle are not people, but genes. G-E-N-E-S, obviously, as in selfish gene. These infinitesimal shreds of chromosome, which have replaced poets as the unacknowledged legislature of the world, are motivated by a drive for survival that would make the rising young corporate executive look diffident by comparison. Many of man's hitherto inexplicable acts and acts a c t a s and attitudes say the sociobiologists are a product of his genes' determination to propagate themselves, according to this theory, when conditions were harsh as they often were during paleo- paleolithic times, though the cooperation of both parents was necessary to ensure the survival not so much of their young 
as of the parental genes invested in them, producing a monogamous situation regardless of what ancestral custom may have been. In more favourable conditions, however, when children could survive under their mother's care alone, men would, men would tend to be promiscuous because it would be in their genes' interests for them to be spread around. In effect, the Stone Age Casanova was motivated not by the desire in his loins, but by the DNA in his chromosomes. The female of the species had no such biological carte blanche. Her genes could be propagated only in the children born of her own body. The result, regardless of climatic conditions, was a powerful genetic urge towards protectiveness. Note 9. And there's a note at the bottom of the page which says, None of this should be taken to imply that the human participants in the drama were aware of how procreation worked. Almost certainly they were not, but the genes knew about it and that was good enough. There is no reason to suppose that either monogamy or polygamy was the rule in the Paleolithic era. The human female's lack of an estrus cycle may have made monogamy possible, but that is not the same as saying it made it probable. Equally, humanity's genetic drive may sometimes have favoured monogamy, sometimes polygamy, but genes were not the only forces at work. On balance, perhaps the most reasonable hypothesis is that the human race originally resembled its chimpanzee relatives in being promiscuous, but that as human nature, in quotes, human nature, that ineluctable compound of hereditary and environmental factors began to develop, so the style of living began to change. Throughout most of recorded history, it has been human nature for individuals to cling to other individuals when life has been uncertain and to become more extrovert when the atmosphere improves. As living conditions fluctuated from good to indifferent to bad during the long ice-scarred millennia of man's early history, there may have been slow pendulum swing from near promiscuity to near monogamy and back again. And it may have been the women, not the men, who were promiscuous, for it was they who were in the minority. See page 30. Now we're on page 22 at the moment, um, by the way. That's the end of that section, so I'll see if I can find the notes. So, yeah, that's 7, 8 and 9. Note seven was um, quoting somebody called Kuhn, K-O-O-N, page 39. Um, number eight, C, among numerous other studies of the chimpanzee, J. Goodall in Advances in the Study of Behaviour, New York, 1970. J. B. Lancaster in American Anthropologist, 70, 1968. A. Courtland, K-O-R-T-L-A-N-D-T, -T, in Progress in Primatology, Stuttgart, 1967, Olbrecht and Dunnett, Chimpanzees in West Africa, Munich, 1971, Teleki, T-E-L-E-K-I, Predatory Behaviour of Wild Cham Chimpanzees, Lewisburg, Philadelphia, 1973, Sugiyama, S-U-G-I-Y-A-M-A. -A. In Comparative Ecology, e oh, Ecology and Behaviour of Primates, London and New York, 1973. And Note 9, Wilson Edward O. There's probably a bi bibliography at the end of the book if anybody's interested, but that wraps up that particular social and um, that particular um, section. And the next section will be entitled sex and the social role but that wraps up wraps it up for now